If jazz is the intersection of chaos and beauty, then San Francisco just may share the same address. Sweetie by the bay, baby. There is no other. That's at least how Ricky Wilson sees it. He's a jazz singer who spent his entire career performing at clubs across the city. We met him a few years ago on his walk to work. You step over shit, you step over piss, you step over garbage, and the main thing, you step over our people, and that's the loss. Over the years, we have done dozens of stories about the hopelessness, filth, and drug use on the streets of San Francisco. Before the pandemic, we walked more than 150 blocks of downtown, and we found the amount of trash, needles, and feces rivaled some of the poorest slums in the world. We saw two-year-olds strolling alongside used syringes. There were desperate people using streets as toilets, and addicts struggling to get clean. I've been out here for so long that Like, it would take literally like a crumb to make me feel like, you know, I was worth something again, you know? Our stories gain national, even international headlines, as we continued to expose the city's ballooning street cleaning budget and held public officials accountable. Like when San Francisco paid a public relations firm hundreds of thousands of dollars to tout the city's supposed cleanliness. People are stepping over needles and human waste and a PR company you paid says San Francisco is spick and span. There are many parts of our city that don't have some of the things that you are talking about. That was Public Works Director Mohamed Nuru. At the time, he'd been at City Hall for two decades. How much longer are you gonna go for? I don't know, I mean, until you get me fired. <laughs> <laughs> he has since pled guilty to abusing his position at City Hall and taking bribes. So bottom line, the dysfunction, pain, and poverty are frustrating, striking, but not new. You've been mayor now more than three years, and these problems are still here. Some have argued they've even gotten worse. So why should anyone expect anything different anytime soon? Well, I think you're, you're minimizing the issue here. I mean, we were in the midst of a global pandemic. Yes, things have gotten worse. And now as we're living with COVID, you know, we're really taking a hard stance on trying to turn these problems around. In the Tenderloin neighborhood, one of the city's hardest hit areas for drug use and crime, Mayor Bree declared a 90 day state of emergency late last year. We are in a crisis and we need to respond accordingly. Her order fast-tracked the approval of a drug treatment referral center in the area and sped up the hiring of 200 public health care workers, including psychologists and counselors. Since the start of the pandemic, drug overdoses have killed about 1,400 people in San Francisco. That's nearly double the number of people who've died of COVID in the city. There are people shooting up on the street, living on the street, dying on the street. How does the tech capital of the world, a city with a $12 billion budget, look this way? Dealing with each of the people that are struggling requires a lot of work. And let's be honest, we don't have the control under state law to make a decision to force someone into treatment. The inability to make decisions or people who are schizophrenic or people who develop psychosis because of their drug use is what the bigger problem is. When someone is a danger to themselves or other people, the sad reality is we have to wait until that line is crossed in many cases in order to commit them to treatment. So how did we get here? For more than a century, people who suffered mental illness in the U.S. were often locked away in so-called insane asylums, which were run sort of like prisons. Eventually, outrage spread over the horrible conditions, and the facilities were shut down in the late 1960s. The plan was to replace those old institutions with smaller live-in treatment centers throughout the community, where people could get mental health services without having to go to a hospital. But not enough of those were ever built. So many mentally ill people wound up in jail or on the street. 
Here in San Francisco, there are at least 8,000 homeless people, according to the city's latest count. But some experts believe it's likely closer to 15,000. And while not every homeless person suffers from mental health issues, a recent San Francisco survey shows about 40% do struggle with psychiatric or emotional conditions. In a single year, that's meant more than 6,000 homeless people in the city were identified as having serious mental health disorders, which is nearly three times the number of mental health treatment beds available. The city only has just over 2,200 beds for people like James Durgan. Have we reached a crisis level here in San Francisco? Without a doubt. Hillary Ronan is a lawmaker on the city's Board of Supervisors. We've been in a crisis around mental illness and, and drug addiction for many, many, many years now. It's what prompted me to write uh, an entire overhaul of our mental health and addiction-based healthcare system. That new program is called Mental Health SF. And while the pandemic delayed major components of the plan, San Francisco was still able to launch parts of it including its street crisis response team, which dispatches paramedics and mental health professionals to 911 calls dealing with homelessness and mental health issues. In its first nine months, they've responded to over 7,000 emergencies. On this afternoon, a man overdosed and stopped breathing. He was close to death, but paramedics managed to bring him back to life. By next year, Mental Health SF hopes to open a one-stop service center for people to get medication, rehab, and mental health services, as well as short-term and long-term beds for anyone in need. That day when you overdosed and realized you're either going to die or you've got to get yourself help, we want that bed for you that day. And that's not the case right now. In San Francisco, those suffering from mental health issues and drug abuse often have to wait up to six months before being placed into a rehab program or getting assigned their own social worker. And many are forced to wait on the streets or in jail, like James Durgan. Mental Health SF aims to change that. Anyone in San Francisco who is severely mentally ill or severely addicted to drugs will have a case manager. And that case manager is going to have a manageable workload. So they're going to be able to follow that individual through their treatment plan. And if they fall off, go find them in the street and encourage them to get back into services. Does that kind of job exist today in the city? No. There is strong evidence showing that type of care just may be what's needed to transform the streets of San Francisco. The good news is we know how to house folks. Dr. Margot Cashel is one of the nation's leading experts on homelessness. As part of her research, she identified some of the hardest to serve homeless in nearby Santa Clara County, those who frequently spend time in jails and emergency rooms. About 200 homeless people were given subsidized housing and were also assigned a social worker, case manager, and peer, someone who was formerly homeless, to help them navigate life. It was resoundingly successful. These were the most challenging folks, and they spent 90% of their nights um, housed for seven years after that. If, if we could do that for that population, the numbers would be so much better for, for everybody else, because we really intentionally gave ourselves the hardest challenge of let's try to house the people who nobody believes can be housed, and they could. So if we know this works, why isn't this being done everywhere? We have not been able to bring it to scale, um, because of cost, because we don't have the housing. California is the second worst state in the nation for housing affordability. We are short a million units of housing that are affordable to low-wage workers, to people on fixed incomes, to people who receive disability benefits. A place they can afford just doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. The city is spending more than $600 million this year to solve homelessness. But about 60% of that goes towards subsidizing permanent housing for people who used to be homeless. That looks like it's money we're spending on homelessness, but it's sort of money that we're spending on people who were homeless a decade ago. That's year-round rent payments for more than 8,000 people. But Cashel says it's the federal government that should be paying. Low-income families can be eligible for federal assistance, like public housing or rent vouchers. 
but only about 25% of families who qualify actually get that help. Because historically, the federal government hasn't set aside enough money for those programs. So San Francisco winds up paying. If the number of people in San Francisco who need that kind of permanent supportive housing is only continuing to grow, is it really feasible for San Francisco to keep paying that bill every year? San Francisco alone can't keep footing the bill. We can't solve this problem when we have 24 units of housing that are affordable and available for every 100 households. The math doesn't work out. And that's in large part why San Francisco can't seem to solve its homelessness problem. Every time one person exits homelessness in the city, it's estimated three more people become newly homeless. And so at the current rate, the city's budget, your tax dollars, while a lot, will just never be enough. Why? Why is it like this? It's not supposed to be. It was beautiful people that are being wasted, lost, left behind. It should be better than this. And it can be. Next time on Saving San Francisco. It's scary. It's alarming. How many people are like James Durgan? Do you have faith the district attorney is doing everything he can to keep the city safe? Um. I think you're going to have to ask him that. But I'm asking you, do you have faith in what he's doing?